Thank you, everybody, um, for coming to this talk. My name is Iqbal Khan. I am a technology evangelist at uh, this company called Alachisoft. We make this uh, distributed cache called NCache. Um, and we also have a NoSQL JSON document database. Today's talk is not about NCache. It's about uh, distributed caching. I will uh, refer to NCache as an example, but the, the concepts are overall, so they apply to all the caches. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to stop me. I prefer to have a more interactive discussion so that we can have, like, instead of waiting until the end. Okay, um, let's get a few definitions out of the way first. Um, the first definition is scalability. Uh, scalability is not application performance. If you have five users and your application performs super fast, you, you, you know, your application is not scalable until it can have the same good performance with 5,000 users, 50,000, or 500,000. So scalability is about high performance under peak loads. Uh, people sometimes confuse uh, performance with scalability. Your application may not have good performance with five users, in which case caching was not going to help you. Uh, you have other issues to solve. Uh, linear scalability is uh, if, you are, if your application is architected in such a way that you can add more servers, and by adding more servers, you can increase the transaction capacity. Again, scalability we're defining in terms of transaction capacity, in terms of how many users, how many transactions per second can your application handle. So if your application can handle more, uh, you know, linearly more uh, transactions as you add more servers, then you're linearly scalable. And our goal is to, be linear scal to have a linear scalability in our application. Um, and we definitely do not want nonlinear scalability, which is that your application is architected in such a way that after a certain point, it doesn't really matter if you add more servers. Your application is not going to increase. In fact, it's going to probably drop. Uh, that means there are some bottlenecks somewhere that have not been addressed. Um, so why do we want scalability? Uh, and which applications need scalability? Uh, usually, these are applications which are server uh, side applications, these are ASP.NET, now ASP.NET Core, web services, uh, IoT backends, uh, big data processing. Um, although big data processing is not common on .NET side, it's more a Java <laughs> phenomena, but it, it should be able to, uh, you, you should be able to do it with .NET as well. But big data processing apps also need scalability. And any other server applications? Uh, you know, for example, you may be, be a bank and, and you've got millions of customers and they call and change address or maybe issue or ask for a new card or maybe they transfer funds and you have to process all of those requests uh, in a batch mode at night and, and there are some you know, compliance requirements that you have to get them done before the next business day. So as you get more and more of these, your, your, even your other batch processing applications need to be scalable. So it's, it's not just these applications, any other applications that just need to process a lot of transactions in a compressed time. And that compressed time in this case is transactions per second, and that compressed time in this case could be within that uh, compliance requirement. Um, so if you, if you have any of these applications uh, that are high traffic or high transactions, then you've come to the right talk. Um, so where is the scalability problem? Why are we even having this conversation? Um, it's definitely not in the application tier. You, your application tier scales very nicely. You have a load balancer, and uh, you can add more and more servers. You know, everything looks very nice. The problem really is in your database, uh, your data storage. Um, and by that, I mean relational databases or mainframe legacy data. Um, and you know, you cannot scale these in the same fashion that you can scale um, the application tier. The reason is because the, the data in this is not distributed. Um, it, it, you know, the nature of the database is that it has to be all put t together. So, and the same goes with mainframe. So, the, the database might be very fast. It might be doing in-memory caching in it on the server end, but it's it's not scaling. Um, and NoSQL databases um, 
although the one of the reasons people use NoSQL is for scalability of transactions. The other is for scalability of um, data in terms, let's say you have terabytes and terabytes of data that NoSQL is much more suitable for that. And the third reason people use it because JSON documents give you flexibility of schema. Um, but NoSQL databases are not always able to help you. And the reason is because they require you to move data away from relational databases into a NoSQL database. What if you're not able to do that for a variety of reasons, both technical and business? You know, some of the data has to stay in your relational databases or in your, in your legacy mainframe data. So, you know, although NoSQL databases are great, and we have a NoSQL database that we've launched last year ourselves called NosDB, as I mentioned, um, but they're not going to solve your problem unless you can put data in them. So if you have to work with relational databases, you have to solve the scalability problem that they pose. And that's where a distributed cache really comes in. Um, a distributed cache essentially um, is an in-memory distributed store. It, it sits, logically speaking, it sits between the application tier and the data tier. F physically, it could be a bunch of separate VMs, or it could sit on the same box as the application, or some of the, it could be here, some of it could be here, and those are the things that we'll talk about. But logically, it is between the application tier and the database tier. And the fundamental argument is that if you cache data, you don't go to the database as frequently. Because you don't go to the database, it does not get all that load, so it does not become a bottleneck. If 80% of the time you can go to the caching tier, uh, and the caching tier does not have the bottleneck that a, a database does because it's also distributed. Just like a NoSQL database, a caching tier is also distributed. It's a key value. Actually, another word for a distributed cache is an in-memory NoSQL key value store. Uh, so because everything that you put in the distributed cache, there's a key and there's a value, which is your object. So by doing that, 80% of the time you're going here, 20% of the time you're going to the database. The database, you know, those 20% is mostly updates. There's some reads, of course. And those updates are also performing faster because there's no competition with read transactions. Um, and this is no longer a bottleneck. Why? Because a distributed cache will form a cluster of two or more servers. These are not expensive boxes. These are not your database server type of boxes. These are typical web server configuration um, just like a four core or eight core box, just lots of memory. Lots means 16 to 32 gig is what we uh, recommend to our customers. So, so, some of our customers go more than 32, but we almost never recommend to go more than 64. It's better to add another box than to have more here because if you add more memory, uh, then the processing power has to be upgraded. Why? Because a .NET application has this thing called garbage collection. And the more memory you have to collect, the more garbage collector or uh, the GC has to do work. And the, the CPU becomes a bottleneck in that case. And, and your application starts to have issues. So the sweet spot is 16 to 32 gig of memory in these uh, VMs or physical boxes. Most of our customers use VMs here. Um, and about eight core as the hardware configuration, uh, and usually two network cards. One network card is for the clustering, and one is for the clients to talk to it. The word client means your application server. So it is not your clients, it is your application server that is the cache client. So a, a minimum of two cache servers, and then a four to one or five to one ratio between the application tier and the caching tier. And that ratio is based mo most on what we've seen over the years, and we've been in this space for over 10 years, um, that if you're adding more servers here to add more activity, then about a four to one or five to one ratio will give you very good capacity. And of course, uh, you add more servers for one of three reasons. You either need more storage because you have me uh, memory needs, as we just talked about, or you need more transaction capacity because you had two servers to start with, and you kept adding boxes here until the, this got maxed out. In a relational database, if that happens, you know, you're stuck. Uh, 
your host, your canned, you know. In this case, all you do is add a third box until the capacity of the third box maxes out and then you add a fourth one and so on and so forth. So you, you can have as many boxes here as you, can, as you want. We, ha we have customers that uh, on average have about uh, five to 10 boxes here and, and some of our customers have 40 to 50 boxes here in the application tier and then they have you know, accordingly. So for a 10 box, uh, for a 10 server application tier you would have about three servers in the ca caching tier. So that's how you do your planning. Any questions on, on this so far? Good, good, very good question. So, uh, you know, the, so what, what are the three things that become bottleneck in scalability? Your memory, your CPU, and your network cards. So if you have only, let's say if you have only one box here, uh, your memory uh, storage may not be that. Let's say you've got 16 or 32 gig, and you're not doing a lot of, ad, you, know, you, you know, you're not adding data, you're just updating the same data over and over. But every object that you're updating is hundreds of kilobytes. And you're doing thousands of requests per second. You will not max out the memory. You will not max out the CPU. You're going to max out the network card. Why? Because that same network card is being used for this communication and for the cluster. And why, why is there load on the cluster? Because, and I'll talk about that, there's a thing called data replication uh, that you, know, you, you need to do, which also is transferring that same object to at least one other box in the cluster. So uh, at least NCache provides you this flexibility. You, you don't have to have two cards, but if you think your object size is larger, uh, and by la larger, I mean more than a 50K or so, um, each average object size, and you know, the network card might become a bottleneck. So it's, it's better to have a second network card, and NCache will, you, you can configure NCache so one card can be used for the cluster, and one card can be used for this. So the applications will see this on the IP address map to the, the let, let's say the first card. And the second IP address is not used by, by the application that is used by the cluster. So you've just increased, you've just doubled your capacity by having two network cards. Uh, uh, so I'm going to skip to a few more. So, uh, so there are basically two options in caching for a .NET person in, in Azure. One is NCache, the other is Redis. If you, if you, if you go with the, these two options, I'm just going to skip. So NCache has a VM model. Uh, so when you use NCache in Azure, you'll go to the marketplace, you'll purchase the NCache VM. So you have the VMs as if they were on-prem. It just happens to be in the cloud. If you go with Redis, you don't see the VMs. So it's a black box. So you have no control over any of these details. Um, um, any, uh, so uh, the goal of the talk so far is to convince you that by having a caching Tier, you no longer will have a scalability bottleneck. So whichever product, whichever caching solution you use, you must incorporate a caching tier in your application. So you, you, you must architect your application to have a cache in your picture. Uh, and, and that way, you will ne never have the bottlenecks. Um, so now that we are convinced that you should use the cache, as a .NET developer, the next question that comes to mind is, where should you use it? How should you use it? Uh, and the first use case is application data caching that, that I've been talking about up until now, which is you have application data in a database, and you cache it here so you, you don't have to go to the database. So it's the same thing. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind about this use case is that the data now exists in two places. One is the master, which is the database, and one is the cache, which is an 
uh, which is you know the other place. So if your data exists in two places, what could go wrong? In uh, cross, you could have two different disparate data. That's it. So it, by if your data, if you have two copies of it, the biggest concern is: is the cache going to be fresh? Is the cache going to have the same version of data as the database? Because if the cache is not going to have the same version of data, then you'll be forced to cache read-only data. Um, and read-only data is about 10, 15 percent of your total data. So you're not really benefiting. You're well, you are benefiting, but you're not benefiting to the extent that, that you should to really make your application scalable. So in fact, it's so much so that if you ask an average person what is a cache used for, they'll say, well, I'll just put my read-only data in it. Everybody's scared uh, you know, of caching transactional data, your customers, your accounts, your activities, data that changes every 30 seconds, every one minute, every five minutes, uh, or in an unpredictable way. So people are afraid to cache that for this reason, because there are two copies of it, and what if the cache uh, you know, does not know that you've changed it in the database? So let's keep that in mind as we continue further. The second use case is uh, if you have an ASP.NET application, the most commonly known is the session state. And that's also the, anything in this one. Uh, the, f the first example is session state. Sessions are something that, by default, you have two storage options. One is in-proc, the other is SQL that Microsoft provides. On an on-prem, there's also a state server. Uh, but all three options have scalability problems. SQL server has performance issues, the same re reason that we, you know, we want to have caching to begin with. So, you know, when you store sessions in SQL, they're stored as blobs. Relation, SQL, like all relational databases, was not designed for blob storage. It's, it's for structured data. So it, you know, it does not perform. There are a lot of issues. May, uh, you know, our, in fact, most of our customers, when they go to NCache, the first use case is se session state. That, because that gets their Im immediate benefit. And the really nice thing about session state is that you know, there's no programming, because there's a framework that Microsoft provides which allows a third-party cache, like NCache, to plug in, and everything just you know, is stored in the cache. Um, the other aspect of ASP.NET is if you don't have the MVC framework, if you're in the pre-MVC framework, which a lot of ASP.NET applications still are, then there's a thing called view state. And for those of you who don't know what view state is, it's an encrypted string that is sent by your web server to the browser only to be brought back on a postback. So it could be hundreds of kilobytes of encrypted string that just go and come back. And when you multiply that by millions of transactions that your application is going to process, that's a lot of bandwidth at the minimum. And bandwidth is not free, by the way. Uh, it's, it's pretty expensive. And second, of course, is that when you have to send that heavy of a payload, your performance, your response time is slower. So it would be much, so much nicer if you, just, if you could just cache the view state on the server end, send a small key, so when the post back happens, the key comes back, and view state is fetched from the cache and presented to the page. So that's the second use case. Again, same way, there's no programming involved. Uh, you just plug in a third party cache, like NCache. The third use case is the ASP.NET output cache. This cache is the page output if the page output does not change. Microsoft already has a framework that caches it in a local standalone in proc. It's better to, ca to put in a third, like a, a distributed cache in place of it so that in a web form, the first time a page output is cached, it's available to the entire web form instead of every web server caching it, it, its own copy. Um, so those are the three. Uh, uh, use cases for ASP.NET applications in addition to application data caching. Now, the nature of the problem here is completely different here. In this one, you have two copies of the data. Here, the cache is the master store. So, you know, you're no longer storing sessions in the database. You're no longer storing view state anywhere else. So the cache is the master store, and it's an in-memory store. So when an in-memory store is a master store, what could go wrong? If the system goes down. That's it. Memory is volatile. You don't have saved. Yeah, so there, there's no persistence. Um, so a, a good distributed cache must replicate data across multiple servers. Uh, 
to provide that reliability so you don't lose that session. Because, you know, you may be an airline and, you know, you did this uh, special weekend promotion for Hawaii and you got a lot, two or three times the traffic on, to your website and there are people who've done all sorts of searches and they're about to hit the submit button and they lose their session. You know, you, you may lose that customer with thousands of dollars in sale for each customer. So you definitely don't want to lose the session. So don't put sessions in a cache unless it does replication. Um, the third use case is a runtime data sharing. Um, this is something that a lot of people did not know for a long time. That and people use message queues for their for sharing the events across multiple applications. But a d distributed cache gives you a very simple and powerful data focused event uh, mechanism where. Think of this now as a, like a service bus uh, or like a message bus. Then these are your applications that can sh talk to each other through this. So instead of using MSMQ or RabbitMQ, which have their own benefits, you know, a cache is not here to replace them. But if if your need is more around data, uh, of if your need of messaging is more around data, and within the same data center. A distributed cache gives you a simpler interface, but more importantly, it's more scalable. So if you have a high transaction application, and again, you know, we're, this whole talk is about scalability. So you know, although you, you could do all of this stuff with these regular message queues, when you go into uh, a very high transaction environment, they are not distributed in the same fashion that a distributed cache is. So a distributed cache will, al will allow you to do all of this, let's say a PubSub type of a data sharing, there are event notifications, there's a continuous query feature that NCache has, which also Java caches have, uh, that uh, Redis does not, um, which, with which you, you can just share data across applications in a very seamless fashion. And here also the problem is similar to application uh, the ASP.NET specific caching, because although this data probably exists in a database, but not in the form that you're sharing it. So you've probably transformed it into some other form before you're trying to share it. So that transformed form is being kept in the cache. So you don't want to lose that data, so a cache must replicate data. Actually, even for application data caching, although technically you could, uh, if, you, if you lose, an, let's say, if you lose some data, because one cache server goes down and you did not replicate, you could technically reload that data from the database. There's no problem, except there's a performance hit. Because uh, whatever, let's say if, if it was 16 gig of data that you lost, now you have to go through 16 gig of database hits, uh, which you don't want to do. So most of our customers, even for application data caching, choose to replicate because memory is so cheap, uh, they, they don't want to even take that performance hit. With these two, you of course have to have it, but in this one, they it's a sort of it's good to have. Any questions so far before I go into the depths of each of these? Okay. Okay. B before we uh, move forward about uh, how to do this, I, I want to first show you what, what a cache looks like. I'm going to use ncache as the example here. Um, so I have. I have uh, in the Azure, I've got three VMs, demo one, demo two, and demo client. Demo one and two are going to be my cache server VMs, and demo client is my application server VM. In your case, you, let's say you, you'll have two cache VMs and then four to five, uh, you know, four to one or five to one ratio of the client VMs. So I am logged in um, to demo client and I'm going to use this tool that NCache has called NCache Manager. So I have it started here. I'm going to come here and say create a new clustered cache. All caches in NCache are named. So I'm just going to name it demo cache. I'm not going to go into the details of what each of these mean. Um, I, I will talk about this in a bit but uh, I will pick a partition replica topology in case of in case of NCache, a topology means how is the data stored and replicated. Uh, 
uh, a partition replica topology uh, is something that, uh, if I were to come back, if I were to come here, uh, think about this as a two node cache cluster that we are about to create. If it is a partition replica, then every server is going to have one partition. So there will be a total of two partitions. Uh, in case of NCache, the entire cache has about a thousand buckets. So about half of them will go to partition one, half of them will go to partition two. Uh, each partition is backed up onto a different server that is called a replica. The replica in case of NCache is passive, which means that no client talks to the replica, only the partition talks to the replica, and the replica becomes active only when the when its primary partition or when the partition goes down, which means let's say if this server were to go, uh, let's say if we had a three node cluster and partition, uh, let's say server three went down, partition three is down now. So replica three will automatically become uh, partition three so that you, you don't lose any data. So partition replica uh, uh, gives you this um, storage and replication strategies. It essentially tells you that uh, you know, data has to be replicated. There's a synchronous and an async replication also. So anyway, so I'll, I'll come back to this, but I wanted to just show you what that means. So I'm going to, so I'm going to pick an asynchronous replication between partition and the replica. Then I will specify my cache server. So the first one is demo one. Second one is demo two. Now everything that I'm doing in case of NCache, you can script it uh, completely so that it can be automated. I will leave all the def defaults. That's the TCP port on which the cache cluster is formed. I'm going to specify how much memory I want the cache to use on this server. And the cache will not use more than this memory. So this actually, whatever I specify here is this times two because there's a partition and there's a replica. So this is the size of a partition, really. So uh, in your case, it's going to be a lot more than this, of course, because if you have 16 gig of, uh, so if you have 16 gigs in a cache server, you should leave about 2 to 2.5 gigs for operating system and other processes and uh, allocate the rest. So if, let's say from a 16 gig, you have 13 and a half gig left. So uh, but 13 and a half divided by 2 would be a partition size. Um, and then NCache will make sure that it does not use more than this memory. So when that much memory is consumed, the, ca the cache is considered full in case of NCache. And then NCache has one of two options. One, you can tell NCache, well, reject any new additions of the data until some of the data automatically expires. You know. Or you can do what this thing called eviction. So NCache gives you three eviction algorithms, LRU, LFU, and priority FIFO. So you, you can say in this case, evict 5% of the cache. So now I want to talk about this a little bit in the context of, let's say that you're storing, in each of the use case here, if you're doing application data caching, eviction is perfectly okay. There's no problem. You know, you just use up the memory that you had, evict some of the least recently used, and then make room for new data. So, so it becomes like a moving window, right? So as you use more and more data, the older one is removed and the, the new one. So that's the most commonly used. But what if it's a session? If the cache is being used to store sessions, you don't want evictions. Why don't you want ev evictions? Because the, that, the session might still be active. It might not have gone through that 20 minutes or whatever your timeout is. If that's the case and you still evict the session, you are forcing that same problem that we just t talked about, which is that a user hasn't logged out, but you're, you're, kicking, him out. you're kicking, him, kicking, kicking him out. So what you need to do is do your capacity planning. In case of NCache, you can do that very e easily. You can um, see how much memory an average session is consuming and, and then do your capacity planning, extrapolate how much memory is going to be used. Do the capacity, so the, so the session storage will never be evicted. Application data storage or application data cache can be evicted, no problem. But the session cache should not be evicted. It should only expire when the user no longer uses the se session. Um, so. so I'm going to just say finish. And I, 
I have a two node cache cluster. I will come here and I will add a client node. In my case, I only have one client node, as I said. Oh, I think I probably don't have the cache service started. Okay, hold on. I need that service so the NCache manager can talk to this and do the configuration. Okay, now that I've done this, I'm going to come here and say start the cache. So now by starting the cache, the NCache is building a cluster between these two boxes uh, th through that TCP so that you don't actually then get into the details of which boxes have what data and where is the cluster. You just know that there's a demo cache Whenever you connect to that cache, you will automatic, your application will automatically connect to all the servers in case of partition replica. Uh, so NCache takes care of all the details. Uh, and I'm go going to c come here and say view statistics. And these are some performance counters on, so that you, you can see what NCache will do once you start to use it. I'm going to also start this tool called NCache monitor. And this is like a dashboard style tool. And in case of NCache, you have this option of using a stress test tool, which allows you to very quickly simulate your application usage without any programming. So for example, I'm going to say stress test tool demo cache. So it's going to do one get, one put, and stuff like that. And suddenly now you, you'll see that this, this tool is talking to both of the cache servers and it's doing about 700 requests per second on each box, about seven to 800, even up to 1,000. Let's say I, I wanna increase the load, so I, I wanna launch one more stress test tool. This is like you would do with your application. I mean, when you wanna test, you, you'll, you know, with your application, you'll run your application with some stress testing tool uh, and then you'll keep adding more and more stress and then you, you want to see whether the whole system works. So right now, you're just testing the cache component of it. Most of our customers, what they do when they evaluate and cache, they do this benchmarking. So, so once they've configured everything in their own environment, even though we have published our benchmarks, they don't, I mean, they, they verify everything in their own environment. So as you add more and more of this, you'll see that this load has just doubled. Let me go one more stress test tool. you'll see that it, it keeps go, going up right there, see? So I can keep adding more and more stress test tools uh, until I can either max out my, uh, my client CPU. So I've gone to about 50% on my application server. So I can definitely add more stress test tools. Once I max out that client, I'll add, add one more client. So that's how I can, so even right now, for example, we're doing about 5,000 requests per second, you know, uh, with just three st stress test tools. So with this, and then, and then you can also monitor, for example, here, all of this stuff. So with this, you can actually see what a cache looks like. And now let's go, go into more from a dev perspective. So now that you know what a cache looks like, uh, let's see how to use that cache within your application. So for ASP.NET, uh, as I said, the first thing that you should do is use the cache for sessions. Why? Because it's the easiest. There's no programming, there's no effort. You can do it. Um, I just showed you how fast you, you can configure a cache with in case of NCache. Um, let's say if I were to come here. And I go into some of the sample code. Should have had them opened already, but I don't. So here's an ASP.NET um, application. For you to use NCache with ASP.NET for sessions, you have to just go and modify uh, web.config. So I, I've got the you know, web.config. The first thing you have to do is add this assembly line add assembly, and cache this session store provider is 
NCash assembly that has implemented the ASP.NET session store provider interface. So this is what allows NCash to plug in. Uh, so you, just, you, you can just copy the line here. And then you just come to the session state tag, which is right here. In case of NCash, you just copy that tag. Make sure that this, the mode is custom because that's what allows a third party cache to plug in. The timeout is what you want it to be. And then the only thing that you need in case of NCache is to make sure the cache name is specified. So once you've installed NCache, the, on the cache servers, you install the server portion. On the, on the application server, you install the, the client portion of NCache. You create the cache like we just did, and you update this. And that's all. that's all the effort you need to start using NCache. And then every session is one object in the cache. When you do that, in that performant counter, you, you'll see how many sessions you're seeing. What happens typically, our, our customers create three caches. So we just made one cache here, right? So our customers will make three caches. One of the caches is for sessions. So they have a separate cache for sessions. They, one of the cache, and two caches are for application data. One is what they call the reference data. The other is the transactional data. Transactional data is something that, is, that changes very frequently. And the reason they do that is because of some of the other features that I'll go into. But on the same VMs, you, you can have more than one cache created. So that's all you have to do for the session state storage. Very easy. No programming need, needed. And then you know, you're all good to go. But if you want to do application data caching, um, Unfortunately, in the .NET space, EF Core now finally provides an architecture where you can plug in a third-party cache. NCache also supports it. But until EF6, uh, including EF6, the architecture did not really support plugging in a third-party cache. And Hibernate, for a long time, supported that architecture. So for and Hibernate and Cache can plug in without any programming. So even application data caching with minimum features, you can just do without doing any API calls. But for most part, you have to be mentally prepared that for application data caching, you will have to do programming. Uh, and, but it's a very simple API. This API looks very much like an ASP.NET cache object. Uh, you, know, you connect with the cache with a cache name. Let me just quickly show you what this looks like. So let me open. I I ran into some Azure VM issues, so I start this other stuff. Otherwise, had this all open. So let, let's say that I've got this really basic console application. The first thing that you have to do is link two of the NCache assemblies. One is NCache.runtime. The other is NCache.web. That's NCache.web is the actual API that you're calling. Then you uh, Link these two, uh, or you use these two namespaces again and cache dot runtime and then dot web dot caching. At the beginning of your application, you connect to the cache based on the name and you get a cache handle just like for a database. Of course, in an ASP.NET application, you'll probably do it in the global dot ASAX uh, in the application start or the init method. Um, then you just create your object and you do cache dot add. So cache.add will use a key, some sort of a string. This is not a good key. You, your key needs to be much more specific. Um, and then here's your object. And that's it. You, you make that call, and behind the scenes now, this is going, let's say if you had that partition replica topology, what's going to happen is your application is connected. So every box is connected to all the cache servers. So you, you just did a cache.add, right? So cache.add will go and look at the distribution map, which is like the, bu the bucket map. Every bucket has a key value range in terms of a, a, a key um, hash key value range in terms of what keys can go into this bucket. So it's going to use that bucket map to know which server it should go and talk to, because it's connected to all of them, right? And it's going to go, let's say you were adding item number three here. It's going to go and add item number three here. And if, this, if you had enabled async replication, the application will go back. And application is done. 
the cache will now, this partition knows it needs to replicate this here. So it will asynchronously in a bulk operation replicate this to the other box and you'll immediately have that item in two places. So that's what that cache.add did uh, under the covers. Okay. Um, sorry. I'm, I'm going back and forth because I wanted to just sort of... Uh, so, so that kind of gives you an overview of what a cache looks like, how to create it, what an API looks like. Now let's go into what are the issues that you have to solve in using the cache for application data caching. You know, we talked about that keeping the cache fresh, right? So how do you keep the cache fresh? How do you make sure that a cache is fresh? The most common and the one that everybody supports, including Redis, is expiration, the absolute expiration. So when you're adding something to the cache, let's say even here, you specify an expiration here, which is, let's say you're saying expire this after one minute. When you say this, in case of ncache, ncache will create indices on the server end, will monitor that data, and will expire this after one minute. So actually, it's that it, this add that one minute, it actually specifies an absolute date time value that was one minute from now. ncache knows that on that date time value, it needs to expire that item. Uh, so that is how the cache automatically takes care of making sure that that data is removed. And what does that mean really? That means that you're saying to the cache that, you know, I really don't feel comfortable keeping this data for more than a minute or more than five minutes because I think somebody's going to change it in the database. So it's only safe to keep it in the cache for that long. Um, there's an, another expression called sliding expression, which sounds like the same, but its purpose is totally different. The sliding expiration is used mainly for cleanup. So if you have sessions, you use the sliding expiration to uh, clean up after nobody's using the session. So when somebody logs out after 20 minutes of inactivity, the session will be considered expired. So it'll be automatically removed. But that has nothing to do with keeping the cache fresh. The absolute expression is the one that keeps the cache fresh. But there's a big problem with absolute expression. And the problem is that you're making a guess um, and you, you know, that this, it's safe to keep the data for that, in the cache for that long. And that guess is not always accurate. So what do you do in that case? Then the, in that case, you have to have the ability for the cache to synchronize itself if it notices a change in the database. That means the cache has to know what is your database. That means the cache has to have a relationship between the, ca the cached item and something, in, some data in the database that you have to tell the cache. And that's where there's this thing called SQL cache dependency in ADO.NET that ncache uses, which is SQL dependency, and this is also called Oracle dependency, which actually works in a very simple way, but it's a really powerful feature. Um, let me come here. I'm going to just use the uh, SQL dependency. So when you're adding something to the cache, you do the same cache.add, right? You have a cache key. Now instead of the value, you specify cache item, which is ncache's own data structure. And in there, it contains the value, but it contains also this thing called SQL cache dependency. This SQL cache dependency is ncache's own class, but it maps to the ADO.NET SQL cache dependency. Notice it has a connection string here and then it has a SQL statement. So the SQL statement in this case is mapping to one row in the product table. So what's really happening here? I mean, you are actually running this code right here. Your database is here, so you're asking the cache cluster to now connect with the database based on that connection string that you just passed it you know, based on that connection string, and you're passing it the SQL statement, and you're saying, please connect with my SQL Server database and monitor, ask SQL Server to notify you, you being the cache server, 
if there are any changes that occur to this data set, that means if this row is either updated or deleted. If that happens, the SQL Server sends a database notification to the, to the client, which, is, which in this case is the cache server, one of these. Um, and then what does the cache server do? The cache server, oops, I'm not. Uh, the cache server actually, um, the cache server removes that item from the cache. Removing means that since it's no longer in the cache, your application is forced to go and get it from the database, which has the latest copy now. So while expiration is a, an educated guess, this is no guess. This is an actual predictable synchronization where it makes sure that the cache is always consistent with the database. Now, there, in case of NCache, there are three different ways that you can do this. One is SQL dependency, which uses database events, which is you know, like real time. The other is uh, our NCache's own DB dependency, which uses polling. And that's for those databases that don't have an event notification mechanism. Or even for SQL Server, if you think that you have too many of SQL dependencies, and for every SQL dependency, a, uh, a SQL cache dependency is created in SQL Server, which is an extra data structure. Think about if you had hundreds of thousands of these created, your SQL Server is going to choke. So maybe it's not a good idea if you have a lot of SQL dependencies to have that way of synchronizing. Then maybe DB dependency is much better, where in one call it can synchronize thousands of rows because it has a polling table that it monitors. Um, and there's a third way, which is to actually just write a CLR stored procedure, have it called by your trigger. So if you have an update, insert, up, uh, update or delete trigger, call this CLR procedure. And the CLR procedure takes the data from that row, constructs that .NET object that your application is using, and it stores it in the cache. Now, this is where an async API is very, very useful because you, you don't want to wait within the database transaction for a cache to be updated. It just slows down the database tra transactions, which tend to time out very quickly. So it's really advisable that if you're going to implement this mechanism, that you uh, use the async methods uh, to go and update the data. So those are the three ways that you can synchronize the cache. This feature is really important uh, because this allows you to make sure that the cache will always be fresh. Uh, without which, you, you're just making a guess. And, and the same way you can synchronize the cache with non-relational databases. You, there's a custom dependency feature that NCache has, which is your code that NCache calls that you can go and monitor your custom data source. Your custom data source could be a cloud storage. It could be whatever. It's just a, you know, whatever code, you know, you, you can go and check. Uh, so keeping the cache fresh is really important, and these are the ways that you can ensure uh, that. Any questions on this? Okay, we've got, we're starting to run short. Uh, so the next feature is read through, write through. Read through is basically, it's again your code. Uh, now all these features that I'm talking about, NCache has them, but, but they're not NCache only. Java caches all have them. Redis may or may not have them. So that's what, what, what you need to do. It, you know, if, you, if you want to do a detailed, uh, if you want to know whether what Redis has or not in case of NCache, just come here and just go to the comparisons. And there's a Redis versus NCache feature comparison. This is this is based on their documentation and caches documentation. So, so you can actually download this and go through all of these features. Uh, so a, a read through basically is your code that sits on the cache server. So it, it looks like this. So it is that you implement. So let me just show you that interface. So the read through interface looks like, so, so here's the read through interface. Here, right here in case of NCache. And uh, there's an init which connects to your data source, dispose, and there's a load method. So load gives you a key, and you give back an object based on whatever data you got. And then you can specify when it should expire and stuff. Uh, 
the same thing goes with write through is that you, you, you have init and dispose and then there's a write to source. So the write could either be add, update, or delete. Uh, where do you use read through write through and why are they so important? Read through, first of all, so the way it works, let's say you do a cache.get and the cache does not have the data. Um, cache will call your read through to go and get it from the database. That's one benefit. Second benefit is that you can combine read through with expirations and database synchronization. So instead of removing that from the cache, you reload it. Uh, write through is, works the same way, except there's a write behind, which means that you only update the cache and let the cache update your database. So your updates also become super fast, uh, which is where the, you know, so whatever the database, you know, whatever the database performance becomes a bottleneck, you have a cache to kind of bail you out. And so, uh, once you have the read through, write through implemented, uh, you can consolidate all the persistence code or mo mo most of it in the caching tier, and you, you can benefit from bo both of these features that we just talked about. Uh, so, once you're keeping the cache fresh and you're also doing the read through, write through, you're now starting to cache a lot of data. So, the cache is no longer just a key value store. I mean, you, you can't, I mean, it's not convenient to fetch everything as a key. You have to be able to search. You have to be able to do SQL search. So you have to be able to do what you are used to doing with the database. If a cache does not allow you to do SQL searching, then it becomes very limiting. Uh, and uh, the same way, uh, because you cannot do joins in a cache, because it's a distributed cache, there are other features, grouping and subgrouping and tags, which allow you to group data and fetch it all in one call. So again, Making it easy for you to find data in the cache is really important if you're going to cache a lot of data. Uh, so, so those features are very, very important. Um, I'm just going to uh, quickly go through a, a few. One feature that I, I really wanted to touch is called near cache or client cache. As soon as, you know, those people who are used to doing standalone in proc cache, when they move to a distributed cache, suddenly their performance drops because they're going across the network, they have to go through serialization, and suddenly the performance is no, no, no longer fast. Many of our customers, they complain, well, I was expecting my performance to go up, it has actually dropped. And the reason is because you cannot compete with a standalone in proc cache which has the object stored on your heap. So if you have a client cache feature, that essentially is exactly, it's a local cache which keeps that object local, but it is connected to the clustered cache. Again, this is a feature that NCache has and most of the Java caches have uh, that will really, re really give you that same fast performance without losing the thing. Uh, I'm going to skip this because I think we are running out of time. Any qu questions before I c conclude this? Uh, for NCache, you can go to our website and d download. It's an open source cache. So you can download the open source cache or the enterprise edition. And as I sh said, you can get all the comparisons between NCache and Redis on that. Thank you very much for your time, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.